Hey guys, hello. My name is Basil Bork and I am a software developer. Uh, I have decades of experience doing uh, custom crafted database. I always use databases for my apps, um, but I'm not a full-time DBA guy. Uh, yeah, so lately I've been doing micro startups, uh, little tiny startup companies. If you ever have any ideas for uh, very small scale software projects, talk to me. Uh, today, this talk is 10 and 10, 10 things, uh, 10 new features in Postgres 10. Um, only I kind of lied, it's more like a baker's dozen. There's, I, I kind of lost count of, uh, of what I just went through the Postgres uh, release notes and blogs, and I just found all the stuff that was interesting to me in uh, Postgres 10. By the way, I haven't, yeah, a couple of caveats, I haven't quite kept up with the very latest versions. Some of this stuff, there were some limitations that might be expanded in the later versions. Um, also, I'm not an expert in any of this, any of these features. It's basically what I've, what I did for you is to go through the blogs and all this, all these uh, articles and files. I built a bibliography on every section that we go through today, and that's probably the most valuable part. If there's any one of these areas that I touch on that's interesting to you, then you can hit those links, and I saved you the time of having to go through all the Google pile. Um, and like I said, there are some big features that I may not even mention because they're so well documented in other articles. Um, this was more uh, stuff that might be useful to me in my own work. So, um, oh, that list, we're going to basically go faster and faster. The, bit, the first one is going to take up a lot of time, and then I'm going to accelerate through, and the, the ones at the bottom are going to be just hit and runs because uh, they're smaller scale. So the very biggest topic is actually... Um, the upshot's real simple. The serial command that we use to uh, define a serial, uh, what it does, there's a sequence feature in, for, in Postgres, and the sequence is simply generating a sequence of numbers, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So it will do that automatically, but do it in a way that is transaction safe and uh, works with multiple users on your database. And it stores the numbers and increments them for you automatically. So what Serial does is to grab that and um, apply it to a table so that when you add records, it automatically increments the number and assigns that number to the table. So I'm going to the, well, the, <laughs> the, short, the short version the, uh, of this is you don't need to ever use Serial again. If you're in Postgres 10 or later, don't use Serial. Use this much longer verbose term. Um, but what I'm going to do is run through the problems because it's kind of interesting to find out the problems that Serial has. Uh, and then um, the benefits of switching over. But the upshot is there is no, there's no upside to using Serial anymore, it's, except for compatibility. I mean, you've got old databases. You do not need to change to the new way. The old way is still supported and not deprecated. Um, but there's no reason if you're starting a new table, don't use Serial. So why do we need this? Well, there's primary keys in your database. Every row in your database needs to have an identifier on it. There's two ways to do that. Uh, generally, uh, well, uh, I was going to say generally, that's my bias. People are split on this. A lot of people like to use natural keys. What that means is you look in your data and you see if there's data that represents uniquely every row. So for example, an employee table, you're going to have maybe employee IDs handed out by your company. So you could use that as the, the primary key to identify each one of the employee rows. Surrogate key is the technical word when you make up your own identifier. So you're going to add an extra column to the table that's not there naturally, and then you're going to have to stick some kind of a value in there for every row that you insert. So the way I often like to do that is use UUIDs, universally unique IDs. Those are 128-bit values, so they're larger. Um, but what's nice is that you don't need to have a centralized uh, coordination place to generate the numbers. Your app can generate them or your database can generate them or you can mix and match both. Uh, the other way is sequential numbers and that's more popular, more common, although UUIDs are getting more and more common. But sequential numbers are still the, probably the mainstay for most tables. So as I said, you're going to need to create the sequence and then attach it to your table and that's what Serial what used to do for you. 
So you used to say small serial, serial, or big serial, and the difference is they were 16-bit, 32-bit, 64-bit. So it just depends on how many records you think you're going to have in your table. Usually 32-bit was uh, common. And uh, this would, uh, well, here we're using it over on the right-hand side. You can say we're saying insert into the table on this column, this value basal, return <coughs> column. So column, what I'm using in this example is our COL is our primary key, and COL2 is our, uh, just our value, whatever. I've got my word, my name, basal in there. So the idea is if you look in that code, we're not referring to this column except saying give it back. So the whole point is that when you insert the record, you can get back this number that was automatically generated and assigned, put into that field and stored in the database. Does everybody follow that? That's kind of database 101. So what are the problems? Well, the biggest is this is not SQL standard. This is a made up word in Postgres, proprietary to Postgres. So it does not uh, port to other databases. The other problem is we're going to see, I'm going to run you through some examples where basically this feature kind of like was convenient when you define the table, but it becomes very inconvenient after that. There's a lot of ramifications that were not thought through or not taken care of by the serial. And mostly it has to do with the fact that it, it looks like a type. When you just, when you say create table column serial, it looks like that's a data type on the column, but it's not. Yeah? Sorry, you may have uh, said this earlier, but when you use the, um, like the constraint primary key mm -hmm. with a column, like it automatically applies like the unique constraint and the um, serial constraint, correct? Uh, it does not apply serial. Yeah, no. The serial does not do the primary key. You actually have to do both. So you usually are using uh, serial because you want it to be the primary key. But technically, yeah, my code here is a little short. I'm leaving out. Normally what you would do is say create table, column serial, space, primary key. So usually the two go together. But they don't have to. You could create a serial column, have a sequence number attached to it, and not be the primary key. Yeah, I, I mean, I know they are technically two different things. I just thought like those two constraints were off or the equivalent of saying primary key, whatever your column name is, like it would No, the primary key is totally separate. I'm going to show you some, some examples and of that, too. It does imply unique, though. Okay. Yeah, it does. So this is what you're getting uh, uh, when you use the command serial. This is effectively what you're getting, is it creates a sequence, gives it a name, it generates this name, which is not always obvious. There is sort of a pattern. But that's one of the major problems, is that figuring out which, what's the name of the sequence that was generated for you in the background. Because you don't see any of this. All you see in your code is the word serial. This is what's being done. So it's also creating the, um, or in your table, it's effectively expanding that serial out to saying this is an integer, depend, um, depending on whether you use big serial or small serial, not null. And it's using default as saying, I want the default values for these rows to be a call to this function. So there's a function command next val. And then you've got to plug in the name of the sequence. So it's doing all that for you. So basically, serial is just a shorthand for doing this. But notice there's no primary key in here. And there's not a unique constraint either. And also, your example, you should leave off column two in this case, since you didn't mention it in the upper right. Uh, yes, you're right. I keep trying to. I'm biased towards to keep my code examples short, but you're right. I should have, well, it's not consistent. It's shorter. Yeah. Um, and alter, um, oh, and then it does this ownership business. So here we created the sequence, and then what it does is to modify the sequence to add an ownership to this um, column. And this is not really very useful, except that what it does is to try to, it was a feeble way to figure out, to, to track that this has serialness to it. The whole problem with serial is that it, it isn't tied. Basically, after this is done, there's no serialness left. It's not a property on the column anymore. And that's what's misleading. When you see that, you kind of think, oh, that's a column of type serial, but it's not. That's where a lot of the problems stem from. So um, that permission I just mentioned is uh, separated. Uh, oh, yeah. So if you create a new user and grant, uh, and then uh, give them permission to do an insert on this table, you would think they could insert on this table. But actually, they will get an error saying that permission is denied because 
they don't have they have access to the table, but not to the sequence that's created. It's this whole separateness that's the problem. Is that the sequence is not tied to the table. So there's a workaround. You got to grant explicitly grant permissions to that sequence as well as to your table. By the way, all these problems I'm covering, all of these are fixed by the new way. So. Um, So yeah, um, if you want to manage it, notice on the right-hand side we're saying restart with 1,000. So if you want to adjust, do something to your, ser your sequence number, like restart the, what number it's at, um, then you need to figure out your name in the middle of it. So that's just another issue. It's another hassle because you're always one step away from the sequence. Then dropping it's a problem. If you, uh, first you've got to figure out that mysterious name but then you need to add cascade on this. If you just drop, well, first of all, let's look at this. On the right-hand side, I've got my table, and we've got a default that's making a call out to, to our sequence. So if we drop this sequence, um, the default over there is still there. So you will successfully delete this, but the default command is going to call a function to a sequence that no longer exists. That's not good. Um, the other one is, if you go the other way, if you try to um, drop this default, this sequence will be left in place. So you might think, well, if I, if I change my, um, that default call over there, I, don't, I want this to go away as well. That was the whole purpose for its existence, was to serve that table. No, it doesn't. This stays around in, in, in your database. It doesn't hurt anything, but now you've got this extra object you don't need. Uh, another one was if you, you can create a table based on another table. That's used the like command. Um, what's good is that it does bring the sequence over, but it uses the sequence for both tables. So now you're incurring, both tables are using the same sequence of numbers. So neither one is getting the full set of numbers. Uh, the, uh, the other thing is that you can't drop, once you've done this, you can't drop the first table, you'll get a, uh, error saying that, uh, that there's other objects because now they're all kind of meshed together. This is a bad, 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 bad situation. Although rare, most people aren't creating tables that way. Whoops. Um, so the replacement for all of this is this generated as identity. There's two versions of it. It's still using the same sequence technology underneath, by the way. It's the same sequence. Um, uh, feature that Postgres has. But what they're doing is just tying it to the table now. So now it's acting more like it really is a property on the table. So there's two calls, and this is a very confusing, a very simple issue, it's very confusing. Um, I'm not a great fan of the SQL standards committee. Um, they do some goofy work, and this is a good example of it. So there's generated always and generated by default. So the whole issue here has to do with sometimes, in some situations, some programmers might want to pass in a value instead of letting it be generated on the, uh, by the sequence. Sometimes you want to override that and pass a value in. This is pretty rare. So the short part of my little talk right here is just use generated always and be done. But if you care about this, the difference is that generated by default lets you pass in a number to override. What's messy about this is that always also lets you pass one in if you put in this syntax overriding system value. So I'm not really sure why they had to come up with two styles. They could have just had always except when overriding. That would have made more sense to me. Does that kind of make some sense to anybody? Well, I said most of us won't care because it's kind of odd to be overriding the sequence numbers that you're writing. The thing that I just like about it is that they gave two ways of doing the same thing. Yes, exactly. And it's very confusing because there are two ways of doing the same thing, and I agree, the always way seems like the way that makes more sense to start with as the default. Yes, and why create the by default if you can do the override anyways? It doesn't make sense. Well, you yeah. could also show like that if you didn't have to specify which of those ways it is. <laughs> it's like you said, it's two ways to get to the same place. Neither of which most people really care about. Like I said, it seems odd to override the values. But anyway, so I put the little orange one as a reminder. You just say generated always as identity. That's what replaces the use of serial now. But notice, uh, here's an example. We're using it. Here's our column. Uh, you put in the type. This, by the way, notice that we're not having to specify the 16-bit, 32-bit, 64-bit. You do that just by the type on the column, and then it figures that out automatically. 
But I also want to point out there's our primary key again on the end. So this is your usual way you're going to create a table now from now on. Can we put those in either order? Did I say uh, column name, uh, column know. type, I don't primary know. key, and then generate it always as identity? I don't know, sorry. Yeah. I can't. Uh, I'm not enough of a Postgres expert to know the subtleties about that. It is just another normal command, so um, it would have the same behaviors, I imagine, as the others. So the benefits, as we said earlier, is that it's, it's standard, SQL standard. Uh, it was in 2003 and it clarified in 2008. So this is over a decade um, old. However, a lot of databases don't support it. It's, it's been um, Postgres, I don't think, is exactly late to the party. Uh, oh, I was kind of, I kind of wanted to mention earlier, because it's not really a type, remember I said that the serialness isn't really there? Well, now it is. So all those behaviors we talked about, if you drop the table, it drops the sequence. Um, uh, I think if you drop the sequence, it'll give you an error um, because it's being used on a table. So all the behaviors you would expect intuitively is what you're going to get with the new feature. Uh, over here, we're restarting. Here we're doing that restart to change the, the reset our sequence number. Notice that we're doing it on the column, on the table. We don't have to refer to the name of the sequence. There is a name, there is a sequence, it has a name, but it's being handled for you in the background like you would expect. So, and yeah, if we do the drop table, it drops the sequence. All the behavior you expect. Um, uh, oh yeah, and the default, you don't need to manage that either. And that creating table, that behavior now is again intuitive. If you do the create table like, they each get their own new separate sequence managed in the background. Is the bottom line you had on there um, include identity excluding? You, uh, when you do the like, you can choose to exclude the identity? Is that um, what you're saying there? Uh, I don't know, but yes, exactly. You may or may not want it to bring over the identity. Exactly. So. Um, like I said, the like before was always creating a new sequence for you, and you may not want that behavior. You might want to, you might want most of that table, but you might not want that particular feature exactly. So that's pretty slick. There are some people who do use this create table like a lot uh, for creating like reports, shadow reports, and create shadow tables where you, on the fly, create the table, populate it, and then throw it away. So that's where that kind of thing is handy. In fact, that would be a good example right there. If you're creating a second table and populating it with report data, you're not generating new data you want to bring over. That's, a, that's the exact example where you would say, exclude identity. I don't want to be generating numbers. Yeah, it's a column constraint. You can use it in any order. Good. Yeah, that's what I expected. Um, so you don't... Um, that if you, you can go back, if you want to, you could go to your old tables and get rid of your serials. And the guy um, that was responsible for this feature wrote a script I'll refer you to. He wrote a whole script that will actually do this for you automatically throughout your database. You don't need to, but if you want to, you can. What's nice is that once you've redef redefined those, the, the columns on the tables, you do not need to change any of your code. All the existing insert, deletes, <coughs> updates, all of those stay the same. Uh, yeah, there is only one of these per table, um, so you still might want to manually create sequences uh, separate. For example, invoices. You know, you might create an invoice number where you want the invoice number sequential, but you might not be using that as your primary key. Um, so you could have it generated as identity and still have a, um, some other uh, sequence attached to it. data type is automatic because now you explicitly uh, declare your data type. 
So all the features that are in a sequence um, carry over. So these are all commands uh, that some people may not be familiar with because um, you don't often need them. But you can start your sequence at a certain number. You can do um, uh, set minimums and maximums. You can make an increment like odd, you know, every other number, you know, one, three, five, seven. Uh, cycle, I can't remember. Cash. Um, uh, oh, cash is when you say I want to create uh, a bunch of numbers at once, a whole range of numbers. If you know you're going to use a hundred of them, uh, it can be a little more efficient just to increment the sequence at once. All of this stuff you can add to your identity as generated. So you can, uh, and they don't exactly explain that in the manual. Basically just know that everything for sequence, you just go look at the sequence commands. All of those you can go back and apply to your uh, identity and generate it. And so, I, uh-huh. Question, so when, it, when you set the max value, mm -hmm. is that saying that as soon as it hits that max value, no more records added? Yeah, here, no this more, is a no goofy, yeah, here's a goofy example of it. Okay. So, um, yeah, I tried to just put them all together. So if we start at 200, we say minimum is 100, which right here at this point doesn't make sense, but it'll kick in. So if we say it starts at 100, max out at 205, cycle, oh, that's what cycle means, to go back to the beginning. So that's when your minimum value 100 will kick in because you're going to cycle back if you hit your maximum. And then I said I'm going to increment my three. So we start out with 200. Our first row is going to be 200. Our next row is going to be 203 because we're increment by three, but we're still under 205. Now we're going to add a third row, so we're going to go to 206, but 206 violates the maximum. So we would get an error normally, except that we said cycle, so that means go back to the beginning, to, not to the beginning to start with, go back to the minimum, and then increment by three. So now if we keep adding, we'll get 100, then 103. Does that make sense? And I think I ran that code to make sure I was right. Um, so like I said, none of this is new, but oh, and this is a good example of the syntax too, by the way. Uh, it goes in these parentheses after generated always. So you, you can mix and match any, any of these that you might want to use. Anybody remember, young guys probably don't even remember written checks. It used to be you get out checks from the bank and they would let you set your first check at a thousand. Yeah. Um, yeah, because then it looked like it was not a new account. Anyway, that's an example of start with. It looks like it might not be a new account. Yeah, it might not, although if it's a hundred, right on a thousand, yeah. So anyway, um, uh, there is a sequence in the background and you can get to it with the command. Um, uh, yeah, so this dynamically, uh, this command is dynamically for a table and a column pulling out that sequence that's attached to it. And then you can feed that into things like get my current value. So that's good, as a DBA you might want to use that to report on your values. Um, so the documentation for this is in the create table and the create sequence has all those options we just covered. And Peter Eisentrout uh, is uh, one of the main um, core developers on Postgres and he did uh, most of this work and has a conversion link. Now I did want, we talked a little bit about primary key. You still need to specify your primary key. So on the left hand side of here is what you get with your generated is identity. The right side is the primary key. So primary key is making it unique and making it indexed. And that also sets up a logical relationship when you uh, define your foreign keys. So those two things, you still need to put them together. And in the box I've got this, again, the example of how you would normally use this in your real work. Um, question, if you uh -huh. did nothing else and you say, you know, select and then a bunch of row, is it going to come back in the order without any further, if you don't say order by, is it going to come back in that order? No, order is never promised when you do a select unless you say order by. Oh, okay. So you can't, and even if it worked in 10 dot whatever, it may not be that way. No yeah, database. That, that's the technically correct yeah. answer. If you need it ordered, you must request it ordered. Yeah. If you ask for it, you may get it ordered even if it doesn't have to return it to you order. You don't rely on that behavior. And I haven't looked, I don't know what the behavior is. Um, uh, but yeah, you should it, count it on it. It's a on silly. So many things. Yeah. Like, 
if they're stored in that order on disk and it's doing a full disk scan for right. the table, right. then it might happen to give them to you in order in your particular test. But if it was plugged into others, and it doesn't yeah, do. exactly. If you want it ordered, you just call order by. <laughs> So here's the link to that article, and um, also a link to the standard. I actually called out the sections in the standard if you have access to it. Um, yeah. That's a lot of work. Here's a little break. Cleanse our palate. These are Australian shepherds. <laughs> uh, not my favorite dog until I met one. Uh, they are um, not related to Australia at all, despite the name. They're actually Australians in America helped uh, develop the breed. And they naturally have a little dock tail. If you notice, I think on one shot you can kind of see a little short tail. It's naturally short, not cut. So next topic, traceable commit. Um, this has to do with a problem of let's begin some work, uh, call a bunch of SQL, and then we do a commit. And right after the commit, we have a crash or a lost connection. Something goes wrong. Did the data get committed or did it not get committed? We don't know. That's a big problem. So there's two ways to handle, well, there used to be one way to handle this, which was the big complicated way is two-phase commits, which most people don't do because it's very complicated. The other way is now we have this traceable commit business. You can get a tra uh, transaction ID during your transaction. You can grab the ID. Then you can call for a status on it. That's what's new is this command, status on my transaction. So uh, the catch is you can't wait too long. And they didn't exactly document this, but I have a quote I'll show you in a moment. Yeah. It's also what crashed, your connection or the server? That's a th well, you don't know. See, that's the whole thing. If you're, if you're the app guy, right, on the, on the calling side, you're calling out to Postgres, you don't know what went wrong. Yeah. You don't know, uh, assuming that your app is still running somehow, um, although even that, you could technically write out this transaction ID. But usually it's going to be a network problem that you lost the connection, but you don't know why or, or when it happened. So when you reestablish your connection, if you have this transaction ID, now you can call status and find out what happened to that. So it doesn't uh, prevent the problems, but it lets you know if there was a problem. Does that make sense? <laughs> um, the catch is you, don't, you can't wait too long. Uh, and that's the big issue here, uh, which kind of makes sense. You're not really going to go start doing a whole lot of other work if you lost your connection and you're trying to figure it out. Yeah? What returns the transaction ID? Uh, next slide here. Oh. <laughs> so yes, we need to capture that transaction ID. So there was a command called transaction ID current. One catch with this is you have to be in the transaction and even then, it doesn't necessarily exist yet. So what would happen is that I think you would call this and it would generate an idea if it didn't already exist in the transaction. Um, and now they have this new command that you can say, call my transaction ID if assigned me if it, was ex if it was existing already. So you can use these to capture that transaction ID and hold it. But again, you have to be in the transaction, not before and not after. Um, yeah, the, the idea is that the, the ID is not always generated until you've done some real work some, in that transaction. So what is the ID? It's a, 32, a pair of 32-bit numbers. Um, yeah, and I found the first part was always zero in my trials. But again, I'm not a big Postgres expert, so I, think I don't know. I think you zero with a lot of load and uptime, you would not see zero. Yeah, yeah, and I was doing little creating databases on the fly and trying. So, um, ah, so this is an example of how you do it. You do like an insert, and then you can do a semicolon in, your, in that line, and then do a select. And now you've got your transaction ID. Um, there's also the alternate syntax where you can do a returning and get your uh, ID back when the insert is done. Um, oh yeah, this confused me at first. What you get back is not a number, you get a, a data type. They created data type, t, t, uh, TXID status, but it's effectively text, so I don't know, I'm sure they have reasons. Um, here's the domain for it, committed, awarded, in progress, and null. Um, so null means, I think this means this is what you're gonna get if you waited too long and it's gone. If there's no more, um, if it's, uh, 
you all, like I said, you waited too long. That, like I said, it's not doc documented, but this is the quote I was referring to. Craig Ringer, who's one of the experts on Postgres, said, um, basically it has to do with being cleaned up. If you're, um, the, there is a history of the transaction, you have to do the vacuuming and all that business. So you have a little while. I, don't, I think in most situations, you're not gonna have a problem uh, immediately checking for it. Oh, by the way, you're taking pictures. Uh, these slides are actually on mine, on the site. Thank you. Yep. <laughs> Sorry, I came late. Yep. Uh, oh, no problem. I will, um, I'm going to try to update them, but I don't think I changed much of this lately at all anyways. So I think they're already up on the, the site. It's kind of cool. They have a new feature on where you look at, if you click on a session on their list, it zooms in to give you a, a whole long description, and their slides are actually live on the page. You can start clicking right through them. Um, Okay, so so the catch here is the committed is good, right? Everything worked. Aborted means uh, uh, also good. It means that it terminated. At least now you know um, your work didn't get done, but you can try it again. The in progress is the mysterious one. So uh, it could mean that it's just not done. What if your transaction had a lot of work to do? It could actually be busy trying to do it. That would mean that your network interruption happened after the commit was uh, fully sent to the server and the server's just busy chugging along doing it. So one option is you wait a little while and then check for the status again. The other one is you could just give up uh, and try to interrupt it, and there's the PG stat activity stuff will let you do that. You can terminate uh, tasks on the back end. Generally, you're probably gonna wanna wait. Well, it's up to you. You're gonna have to make some judgment calls to how long you think that work would have taken. This does not replace the two-phase commit stuff. This is just sort of a stopgap so that you don't, it solves a lot of the problems uh, that people might want to have to go to a two-phase commit. Um, so if it works for you, it works for you, and it's a whole lot simpler. Uh, oh yeah, I think Craig Ring Ringer did the work on this, Second Quadrant uh, company. Finish that. Next break, these are Maine Coon kitties. A uh, friend just recently told me about them. They're gigantic cats. Uh, they're supposed to be really nice cats, and they are in Maine, the state of Maine. Uh, there's different legends as to how they got there, but they grow ginormous. There's pictures on the internet of people, two, two arms of a cat falling off each side. Yeah, so parallel query. Um, this was a really hyped feature back in 9.6 that they had parallel query. The idea is that if you have multiple cores on a machine, uh, instead of doing one search through the whole database, how about if we chop it up and give it to different cores and we can get this, the queries done a whole lot faster. Really exciting, but like usual in Postgres, they, they take baby steps as they implement features. So because they have to, um, uh, they insist on high, high quality and reliability in Postgres. So it was very limited. I'm going to talk about that. It's still really limited, but um, it did get enhanced in uh, version 10. So if you can take advantage of it, then you should see a double to quadrupling maybe in your uh, search speeds. Now, in the future, this will get even better. Um, and here I have a note about seeing daggers. Uh, like I said, all of this. Uh, in the future might get better. So that the daggers specifically, I'm making notes in here where they have already noted, you know, we, there's a limitation now, but it may get um, eased or expanded in the future. Uh, there's some the terminology. This gather node is the tasks that are being uh, chopped up, and they get assigned out to a background worker process. And what this is is basically another user connection to the database. So you have to keep in mind that you are using up memory, just like a, a user session, um, and you are making another connection to the server um, internally in the server itself. Um, uh, and another process, you're gonna see another process. If you're looking at your Postgres processes and your uh, top command or your whatever your uh, viewer is in your OS, you will see um, all of these background workers are gonna show up as Postgres processes. So what that means is you don't want too many of them because they are a process, they do take memory, there is a cost to having them. So in 9.6, um, again, being conservative, this feature was off by default, you had to turn it on. 
Now it's on in 10 going forward. Um, but because you want to be conservative, they have a set number of maximum limit of workers that can be running in the background. Uh, and then they also have the idea that for out of a lot of processes that are in the background, how many of those do you want to go to any one of these queries? Then they realized this was actually limiting because these worker processes in the background are used for other things besides parallel query. So in 10, they now have three different settings that you can change. So one is all of my background workers. Another one is just how many of my background workers can be working on parallel queries. And then inside of those, how many of those can be assigned to the same query? Does that make sense? It's, uh, uh, it's logical. I I think those might be, the, I can't remember if I looked up the defaults. I think that is the defaults right there. Um, so you need to consider expanding those if you want to make use of this feature, um, if you think you've got the hardware to handle it. Obviously, there's a limit if you don't have a lot of cores. You know, if you've got two cores, this is not going to help you much. If you've got 24 cores, then you might want to expand it. Um, so there's a lot of conditions just to do the planning. Not even ex next time we're talking about executing, but just getting ready uh, for the planner to consider using parallel queries. These are the limitations. And, um, and like I said, I was kind of surprised how very limited it is uh, where you can really do a parallel query. First of all, um, you have to be in multi-user mode, not the single user. You have to, of course, set some parallel workers. So if you set that number to zero, you're not giving it permission to do any parallel if you, um, you also have to have the memory type set up, which I think is going to be normal. Um, you have to be in read-only mode. So see the dagger, that might change in the future. But right now you have to be in read-only. Um, you can't, anything that would cause a big long pause in this, uh, like the um, uh, declare cursor and that PLPGS QL looping, that will disqualify, the planner will disqualify this for pa uh, parallel um, query. Um, you can't do nesting or parallel within another parallel. Again, dagger, maybe, that might change someday. Um, and you have to be serializable. So between read-only and serializable, this you know, really reduces the number of situations where people are currently using it. But again, that had a dagger on it. So, so let's say you passed all those criteria. You're still not executing. It got planned, but now, what if there's no workers available? If you've got other queries that are doing the parallel queries, that means there's none available, so you're still going to do the regular old, uh, you know, long style sequential scans. Um, oh, the execute message, I can't remember, but uh, if that happens, you're not going to get executed. As a qu your query, am I clear? Your query is going to get executed. It's just that it won't be parallelized. That's the word. Um, if you do the as execute, and this business, if it's not serializable, now you might think, how could it not be serializable if I pass the planner? Well, you can actually, in the execution, uh, do a change in, this, in the um, isolation level. So if that occurs in your code, then this is gonna not execute as parallel. So again, even more restrictions. Um, Uh, what's, what's happening is um, uh, it's basically getting smarter in how it does the scans. So the old way was table block uh, handed out to each of the workers. Now what they do is um, they can use the indexes to create chunks to be handed out. So basically it's index based um, but optimized. So the old one was not. It was all sequential scan only. So, uh, but it's not for all indexes, it's just the D tree. It's still much better. Yeah, it's getting better. And I mean, this shows you, uh, like I said, I really appreciate Postgres. They do not go crazy for features like a lot of projects do. So, you know, they build stuff in, they start with the sequential scan because that's the easiest case. Now what they've done with the B tree is say, how can we make use of the index but still chop it up and parallelize it? So they, they don't deliver features until they're fully baked and fully tested. So um, again, they got daggers on that because might we might get more kinds of parallel scans in the future. Um, and there's parallel joins now. Uh, they've added uh, one more type to it that 
uh, was already in 9.6. So, uh, who's this? Yeah, Robert Haas uh, was the lead, I guess, on that, and there's some good links for you. Another palate cleanser. Uh, oh, how long do we run? I think we go till two, don't we? I think so. Yeah. So this is a long session. So yeah, this is Morocco. I've been there once last year. Uh, although I just went to Casablanca. So I didn't go to any, oh, I went to that mosque in the lower right hand corner, it's a famous mosque. It's one of the biggest in the world and one of the few that allows non-believers. Um, oh, and by the way, I went there for a Java conference. Yeah, it's kind of funny. They have a, like 2,000 people at a conference there. Um, Now I'm getting tired. I'm going to blank out on some of this. Uh, uh, ooh, I am sorry. Uh, oh, yeah. The um, statistics. Yes, this was super important because um, statistics are used by the planner to come up with smarter plans. So uh, you can always do the... Um, the commander's command to tell you what the what what the plan is going to be for explain. query. Explain, yeah. right? So you can do an explain and see what how it's going to approach uh, executing your query. Um, so the problem was it depends on statistics that are gathered to look at your actual data and see what kind of values you have and how many rows. And what uh, the limitation was that they only did that per column. Well, sometimes you have associated data uh, between columns. Um, that's called a functional dependency. So, for example, um, um, uh, let's see a good one. Yeah, so here's one example. Birth date and age and is minor. So, um, obviously the age and the birth date are conjoined, you know, they're related to each other, and uh, the is minor, of course, is related to the age. So if you have this kind of a situation, um, then you, kind of, as a human being, you know those are interrelated, but Postgres doesn't know that. It just treats all the columns as separate. So now the whole idea, and this happened, by the way, often denormalized. That's an example where that's denormalized. Um, so when you have that kind of situation, um, oh, here's another good example, the zip codes. Um, zip codes almost always tell you your city, but not always. There are cities, um, that are split, you know, where a zip code actually overlaps. Or a zip code may cover more than one city. Um, yes, you could actually incorporate multiple yeah, towns or pieces. So, but not generally, right? Almost always, you know, this, you know, there's it's certain zips that you don't need. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's going to be, uh, yeah, it's going to be very few. That's an important consideration here where this association um, is almost always true. Um, uh, if it was rarely true, you wouldn't want to engage this feature. But if it's generally true like zip codes, then what you want to do is you want to tell Postgres that these columns relate to each other. And that's what's now known as cross-column statistics. So you can say, explicitly say create statistics on these multiple columns. So if you're in this situation, this could be hugely useful to you in terms of performance for queries. So does it automatically gather this from foreign keys if you define the relationships? Oh, I don't know. Did I say, uh... you mean across tables? Yeah. I... If you're frequently using that foreign key relationship because you've got a very denormalized structure, but like you know that there are a bunch of queries that always hit that particular Yeah, I have no idea, but I doubt it because again, that would be more complicated. And I doubt they would have implemented that now. Yeah, I don't think so. I think these have to be, these columns have to be on the one table. But you could create a temporary table. Um, yeah, I'm thinking more about, uh, I can control the database, but I can't really control the particular application that's using the database. So yeah, I understand I, your intent. Yeah, I just if I have ways of telling Postgres, this application is going to be asking you for this stuff. No, it's a really good question, but I don't know the answer. But I doubt it. I doubt it. it's going to work that way. Um, 
So you can drop these statistics later if your conditions change. Um, I think if any syntax matter here. Uh, oh yeah. See, there's actually a number. This cap, this dependency number, 1.0, uh, is uh, is is um, how close that data relates to each other. As we said, the zip code's a partial one, so you wouldn't say 1.0. And I think this is your judgment call as to how close a fit that is. Um, though I couldn't guide you on what numbers to use. Um, so that's enough of that. Oh. In the business, if you start searching for this, Googling for this, all of these mean the same, these are different terms all for the same idea. So it doesn't, doesn't help. <laughs> so that's why I gave you these links uh, to help you. Um, these are actually live links in the slides. You can just click them. Um, this is another uh, person from Second Quadrant did this work. Yeah. Oh, see the gold star? That means that's like, that's the thing to read. That's the best piece. The other stuff sort of more further additional information. And this is not exactly a break. This is more a little strange, my strange introduction to the next feature. Uh, a painting, another painting, mm -hmm. and yet another. Got trees going on. And kind of a funkier tree. And maybe kind of, sort of, a tree. There's kind of a leaf or two or three. And you probably know this. It's not the uh, Partridge Family bus. Uh, that came later. This is the famous Mondrian painting. And all of those were done by him. Uh, these were not done by him. These were inspired by him. I um, vaguely remember this as a kid when this uh, came out, the uh, kind of famous, the goofy dresses based on the painting. So all of this uh, was related to him over time. So that's my goofy way to introduce the idea of collation. It's hard to spice up uh, dry database topics. Um, so that the idea is the ordering. Collation is all about ordering your rows. And the ordering of this, uh, these are somewhat in time order. And you can kind of see where he's working with more and more abstraction and working with more and more strict uh, geometry. Um, <coughs> although it's kind of curious too when I look this up artists don't really care about like tracking data accurately so it's funny how a lot of paintings they don't know exactly when they occurred uh, there's often a range when they talk about provenance on when the when that was thought to have been produced there's but that's generally in his order the artist is actually working on it because a lot of times they'll just work on it when they've got a muse and then set it aside and yes come back yes later. yes or being produced time. you know I'm sure this sold a lot better than this did. <laughs> so. <laughs> so anyway, that's my introduction to collation, um, which is the rules for sorting. This to me is huge because i um, kind of a geek about Unicode and multi-language stuff, multilingual. So um, we have rule, there's lots of rules related, a lot of issues related to the rules. These are diacritical, the accent marks you're familiar with. Um, and this stuff can be handled differently in different languages. Different cultures have different rules for this stuff. So in Swedish, the Z comes before the O with the umlaut on it, and German just the opposite. Um, uh, same thing, you know, French too. It's like which one of these, when you've got words that end with the E's, which one comes before the other one. Um, there's also issues to do with the white space. And here's examples, resume, 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 uh, all kinds of different. Case, uppercase, lowercase is an issue. So what is the huge new rule? Well, the old feature was um, that they uh, depended on the host, OS. This was really bad um, because, first of all, it's inconsistent, right? You're getting different behaviors and you move your database from one, you know, from your Mac OS development to your, uh, you know, Linux server. Uh, or BSD server in a Linux testing environment, you're getting different behaviors in each one of those because of the OS. Um, and I don't know if I mentioned it, but this feature came about because of Linux. One distribution of Linux, some cowboys decided to change in a minor update, right, third digit or whatever update, decided to change the collation rules. Well, these rules are used when you build the index in Postgres. 
So people were doing a minor update, what they thought was a minor update, and breaking their, their indexes on their Postgres servers. So that's the real life story of why they created this, was um, they realized that it's not, given that Postgres is meant to be so heavy duty, enterprise reliable quality, we shouldn't be depending on some cowboy programmer that decides to change our collation on the fly. So, um, uh, yeah, so this is really bad in a whole lot of ways. Um, uh, and the thing is, Postgres doesn't need to figure out collation. It's already been figured out. The Unicode uh, Consortium has uh, produced rules for this stuff. And they've implemented code. This stuff, there's a whole history, I don't know if I mentioned it, but there's a whole history of um, uh, work that's been done. A lot of it was originally in Java, moved to other environments, moved back to Java. So it's been refined over years and years, and it's a big, giant library that already exists to implement all kinds of rules across all kinds of cultures. Uh, and it's called ICU, this International Components for Unicode. So, um, yeah, that's what I was saying. The history, it's been on different platforms, different versions, and now, you know, one and two decades later, it's very refined. Um, uh, it's used all over the place. Some of the OSs use it, Java uses it. Um, it's also now pretty stable. It's not changing very much. Uh, one, when I gave this talk before, some people were kind of concerned. This means that you're going to have a copy of this ICU library in your installation of Postgres. So it could change when you go, when you update your Postgres, you could get a new version of ICU and see slightly different behavior. And that's my point about stable. There's not a whole lot changing for most languages nowadays. Um, Unicode has really settled down. <coughs> They're still adding stuff to Unicode, but we're talking real obscure uh, academic, you know, interest, you know, academic level languages that aren't even very used very much. Um, so yeah, I'm super excited about this. Probably of all this stuff, to me, this is the most useful um, uh, in version 10. Um, uh, yeah. This is how you use it. When you create your table, you can specify your collations. And whereas you used to have very few choices, like that's EN for English and US for country, now um, there's all kinds of um, finer ones. You can have this dash, dash, dash business. You know, there's, I've seen some like, you know, Switzerland, German, oh, like, oh, I think I have an example, actually. You did on the previous slide. Oh, did I? Uh, you had one about uh, the OAuth umlauts versus the... No, no, no. I was going to say, no, the names of them. Here it is. Um, I was looking at these for fun doing this talk preparation. This uh, own book. So there's rules in German, in I, that might be Austria. I'm not sure what country. They're phone books. Apparently, the phone book industry did their own set of rules on how to sort them in the phone book. So that's a subset of the German and Austria rules. So I like using these specific things when returning data to a user if mm -hmm. you want it sorted in a specific way. But I hate the idea of storing data in the database that way. I would just love a correlation that is worldwide just flat, not language specific. You're going to get that, uh, again, I'm not a Postgres expert enough to know. I think you're going to get that normally when you just choose the UTF-8. It's got its own... Um, well, normally it doesn't really matter how it's stored except for in the indexes. So I don't know the details on that. Um, I think it's kind of a non-issue. You should just be naming your tables in UTF-8. Uh, uh, oh, you do specify a collation. I always do English US. Um, yeah, but I didn't realize it actually mattered before. I thought it was just extra junk. I don't think it matters because the collation, apply, the collation rules always apply after. Uh, you know, you're getting a default collation. If you don't specify this collate, when you do your select and don't specify collate, you're getting a default one. So that's probably where it kicks in. Um, and, uh, and actually, Unicode actually is in sort of a, the actual numbers assigned to all the characters are sort of in a, a collated order. Um, so you're going to kind of get roughly that just by using natural. And that might be what's in Postgres. I can't remember. I'm not uh, sure, but now I want to know. I want to be able to tell it to you. Yes, and you're making me want to know now, too. <laughs> I want to find that out, too. 
I haven't thought about that. But I, I think what you're asking is what happens if you don't specify your collate, what behavior are you getting? I think more what I want is, at least in the shell, I would like to just tell it to use the C collation, which is don't sort my characters for me, do that later. No, oh, again, I'm not expert enough. I don't think you want to use the C collation anymore. I think you're going to want to use the UTF-8 only. Uh, See, this is I, where I'm not sure. Is I just wanted to not resort things and just... You want to dump data out. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want it to spend time doing work that I don't want it to do yet. I am pretty sure you don't want the C collation, though, anymore. That's just it. I don't know what I want now. Cause they Try to remind me. Come over to our booth. and There's experts in the booth we can talk to and figure this out. I know there's at least one guy there who knows I mean, some of this collation like, I just stuff. want it to be clear in the documentation so that when I do go to figure this I out... I know it's not easy. clear at all in the docs. I struggled with this when I first started with Postgres. It was very confusing to me. So, and generally... Well, the other thing, I would like a list of standard collations that you can expect to find to be in the docs. Because I remember the last time I looked this up, I was very disappointed that yeah, there was not that, the that, basic list of, you should be able to find these. Right. Well, now you know why, because it was dependent on the OSs, for one thing. Yeah. Back. Okay? Now, you have this humongous list that is defined by uh, the Unicode Consortium. So, now, like I said, if you want to use the German-Austrian phone book industry's version of sorting, you can do that. Anything that's defined by ICU. So that's what's cool is all you have to do is to figure out what version of ICU is being used in that version of Postgres and go look up the ICU docs. And everything you want to know about the, the collation is going to be explained there. Well, that was the point of this slide. More variants available, more variants than you ever imagined. Uh, oh, abbreviated keys. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I can't remember. Something's uh, gone from my head. Um, it was a huge speed benefit for... Yeah, faster sorting and index related to these abbreviated keys, but I... Uh, oh, it was a new feature in 9.5, and now it's much faster because of this. Oh, is that just doing a partial sort? I can't remember, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, in the future, what this will bring, again, it's always baby steps. In the future, uh, you know, case insensitive is searching is always an issue in databases. Um, so this may be solved because I, uh, with these ICU features. And being able to say, ignore the diacritical accents and just give me the raw characters, sort on that, or, or search on that. Um, so that could be... Uh, more benefits and speed and eliminate some of the hassles we do right now for case sensitive searching. Uh, this is Peter Eisentrout again, and there's your gold star uh, article to read. Uh, another piece of art. No, uh, was there a point to it? No. Oh yeah, it is. There is a point. Replication. It's it's. Uh, this is a painting of a house. But then this crow thing is attached to it physically outside the painting, um, which is my crude introduction to logical replication. Um, so you've got your database, but then you can have another database. Um, there is actually another guy here, Robert Bernier, in our booth, is uh, done work with this and has a really good talk on this. Probably on our, by the way, I'm, um, the booth I'm referring to is run by Seattle Postgres User Group. So if you're in the Seattle area, uh, check us out. We meet every month on um, the Fred Hutch campus on East Lake. So, uh, and I think the talks are online uh, on either Meetup or our website. So, uh, he's given talks on the logical replication. So, the issue here is that when you do replication, the idea is you got your database on a server, but what if the server blows up? So, you want to have your data on another uh, backup server. So, uh, in Recent versions of uh, Postgres has gotten better and better at having a built-in replication feature where you send the write-ahead logs that get written to protect your data. When you in, uh, insert a record, it gets written to the write-ahead log before it goes into the database. So once that feature was up and running and solid for years, then they said, well, what if we take the wall file, move it to the other computer, and have that other Postgres cluster read the same wall file in and write the same data to the same tables? This is great. Works great now uh, in the last few versions of Postgres. The catch is, is that it works for your whole cluster. All the databases or catalogs 
defined, all the schemas of all the catalogs with all those tables, they're all being replicated uh, together. Um, you can't say out of my 12 databases, I only want these three to be replicated, or I want this one replicated there and that one there. You can't do that. But what you can now do is sort of some limited version of that with this logical replication. Um, so you can, it will help going across versions. For some people this is really important. It can help during upgrades. Uh, and you can do some replication by table. This sounds like a log shipping in Microsoft SQL Server. That's, no, that's regular physical uh, replication is the log, is the write-ahead log being sent over to the other. Yeah, that's log shipping. So the, the problem, one problem with uh, log shipping is that the destination server, once in a, now it's readable, but once in a while, I guess when the log gets pushed in, it's inaccessible. And, and yeah, so it's, it's a kind of a problem. You mean on the other product or you mean on Postgres? Hmm? You don't mean on SQL Server. Yeah. Like that's on a, SQL Server. Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering if, if Postgres has that same sort of problem with this. Well, right now, the way the physical replication works is that it is replicating on the other computer. You can't actually use it to do queries if they're read-only. It all has to be read-only. Mm -hmm. So you can't do any writing on that back right. on the server. Right. Um, but you can do queries. And I don't know of any delay. I mean, you're always behind a moment. You know, it's, it's until the, the, uh, the wall file gets told. talking about a world freeze on a thing that you're replicating to when the log gets shipped over. Yeah, you know, at, at the moment when it's written in, it's actually like locked out. And you, I, you, I your queries the way, will fail. I believe the way the Postgres version works is that it's continuous. It's yeah. not a gigantic batch. Yeah, I've not heard of that kind of lockup problem. When the wall's being integrated into the, the replicated server, I don't believe there's any delay uh, because, because of uh, the MVCC uh, versioning that Postgres has. It's used, applying that, I believe, when those are being integrated. Now, I could see if you're shipping over a lot of data because of some gigantic query that ran or a lot of data that got put into the database otherwise that then you might see a performance hit on the real You could see a performance yeah, I mean, hit. It might slow it down, but it won't you know, stop it. Walking, whatever. Right. Right. That's normal, but, right. but I'm talking about when, when the whole database is just like frozen. No, it's see, that's normal. the whole, I don't think you're going to see any of those problems with Postgres because the wall log integration is the same. What happens on the primary server, mm -hmm. it's the same technology that's being done on the, on the backup. So it's, it's as if that data... Like I said, data coming in is written to the wall and then incorporated into the database. It's happening the exact same way on the, rep on the replicant as it is on the primary. Um, I don't think I'm going to... Um, yeah, the physical you can use block addresses byte by byte. Um, uh, it's also known as screening is another term. Uh, I don't know much about this. I'm not, I think I'm going to talk about it because this has been covered a lot in other... Uh, yeah. This has been covered a lot uh, in a lot of places, so I didn't they want to spend time on it. This year at Linux Fest, and it was good, and you should definitely see their talk. Yeah, and it is. Um, or rather, uh, this is one of these things that's also getting better. Every version of forty of of every version of Postgres is going to be getting better. Well, this is the thing I was interested in. Um, what's my intro? Ah, timestamps. Time yes, I love this photo because it's um, if you're a time geek uh, like I am. Uh, this is the center of the universe. It's the Greenwich, uh, the old Greenwich uh, Mean Time. This is the Royal Observatory in Britain where GMT, the line, runs through physically. And they have this clock, which if you notice is different looking because it's 24 hours. It's a 24 hour clock um, running there with the, with the one true time, UTC time. So. Yeah, so timestamp, now we're getting faster. All these new, these remaining features are uh, smaller and smaller. This one is really nice because when I first looked at the docs, one of the first things you want to do in real work, right, is like an invoice when received, right? So you look up date time types. There was this horrible paragraph at the top of the page about this floating point timestamp and why it's bad, you don't want to use it, and what it is, and I was like, what the heck? Gone. It's removed. So um, this was almost never used. It was a really old implementation, alternative implementation for the timestamp data type. So timestamp still there, works the same way. You just don't have to worry about um, not using the floating point type anymore. Um, and it really simplified that page uh, of documentation. Um, oh, I think this is just an aside. 
They dropped, uh, you know, it's amazing how long they keep features in Postgres. Um, they dropped uh, some PG dump for way back to Postgres 7.4. I don't even know how many years ago that would have been. And the, um, uh, oh, they have an old protocol for uh, talking to Postgres from your library or driver. Um, there was some old protocol that they finally got rid of. That was, what was that, 20 two years ago? Later. Yeah, two decades later they got rid of it. Yeah, so it was supported all that time. Um, yeah, so you probably know there's been a big change in the numbering system, which is really great because they used to waste a lot of time with the technical, the core technical people used to argue about the numbering and the marketing aspect of that. So fortunately, that's, they've now figured out a whole new major minor structure. There's technical considerations, though, is that for anybody upgrading, there is the issues that the word xlog appeared in a lot of different stuff for the write ahead log, and they've changed it since everybody calls it write ahead log. They've changed it to WAL. But this terminology means that if you have scripts or tools that were looking for these things, those are going to break. So that's one thing to consider when you upgrade. Uh, in practical terms, this is probably the biggest negative. You know, if, if you're a person that has scripts or tools used doing that kind of work. You know, rarely does stuff break in Postgres, but that's one. Um, oh, what's this? Uh, oh, yeah, this is where this is used, this xlog. I looked it up. It was in two, two uh, I can't remember what directory is going to go with that in. 12 functions, some other system views, six, so it was used in 20, 30 places. So it is kind of a dramatic change. Although I'm glad they do this kind of cleanup work. Um, uh, passwords. Um, no more clear text. They had an option, I think it might have even been the default, I can't remember. Now they just don't let you uh, say passwords uh, in clear text. Um, this scram thing is new, not to really be worried about because I think it only works in the C, li yeah, live C for right now. But I wanted to mention it because it's apparently a very modern, good way to do authentication. I think they might expand it. They talked about expanding it. But right now it's only in this live C. So like I'm a Java developer using JVC, so this is not relevant for me. Um, so you can see on the right there that they've added a new type. We had clear text, they took it away. And you can still do the salt hash in D5, but now there's this new scram. Uh, and that's a link you can click if you want to learn more about it. The other thing is you can, and you've been able to do this for a while, enable and require TLS uh, connections between the client and the server, which also helps to avoid the yes. stuff. Yes, yeah, you can do TLS stuff, yes. Actually, I think that's authentication, which is a client-side TLS certificate. I'm not sure if that was supported before or not, but that may be different from the actual security on the connection itself. Oh, I see what you mean. Right. Yeah, and I don't know about that. I do all my... I use local connections. Um, I don't have users connecting in directly, so this is not a big issue for me. Um... Row level security. So Postgres is pretty advanced in that you can actually have security row by row uh, if you want to. Um, and the difference was uh, logic. It's this or versus and. Um, so it's more flexible. No, I'm sorry. Slip my mind. Um, uh, the upshot is that it is. I oh, think I think your security script. policies can be added in. I think that was it. Yeah, yes. that's, that's what it's doing. Yes, for. yeah. Um, again, your Gold Star article for that stuff. Oh, that's it. That's it. Done. Okay. We're 20 minutes early. All right, thanks. Well, I gave this at uh, our Seattle user group, and we went for like two and a half hours because uh, everybody was chiming in on their experiences with all the good and bad parts, uh, you know, all the problems that were solved and so on. So that's it. Jeez. <laughs>